sixth one in just two days. We are in the process of finalizing the report and I would like to thank you all of you who submitted written contributions. I've mentioned that at the beginning of our COSAC meeting, um, 10 chambers so far has submitted such contribution, have submitted such contributions. I would also like to thank all parliaments that participated in the COSAC working group meeting we had in Brussels on 26th of March. I think our discussion was very fruitful and informative and we managed to involve uh, more national parliaments one way or another to the work of the task force. Most of the points that were raised then are reflected in the draft contribution text the chairpersons agreed upon yesterday. Now mention such a, uh, some of them, extending the deadline for subsidiarity scrutiny from eight weeks to at least 12 as one of the ideas. The green card, increasing the focus on proportionality, early involvement of national parliaments in the legislative process, improving how contributions on the subject of subsidiarity are dealt with, improving the impact assessments. I sincerely hope the work of the task force and our cooperation on the subject do not end after the 15th of July, the deadline to present the report. I firmly believe that this is a process, a marathon and not a sprint, as we say sometimes, and that COSAC should continue to be active in this regard. Moving on with the session, I remind you that you can submit your request for the floor until the end of the speech of the last keynote speaker. Once we open the floor for debate, we'll no longer accept requests. And as we did in the first panel, 15 seconds before the end of your speaking time, you'll hear the ring. Some, somebody cut me already. <laughs> you know, the system that I like so much. So the ring bell is, sounds like that. Good, now, now, moving on to Bulgarian, I give the floor to Mr. Kirill Vojtchev, journalist in one of the leading Bulgarian media, who will moderate uh, the keynote speaker's interventions. Mr. Vojtchev, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Viganin. I promise that I will be a good timekeeper. From my experience in the political uh, radio event in the Bulgarian National Radio, I know that when politicians speak, uh, timekeeping is not an easy job, but I rely on the experience of our keynote speakers uh, who are parliamentarians and they know that timekeeping is important. Our topic is interparliamentary cooperation in the context of the debate on subsidiarity and proportionality. I will not make any historical introductions to the topic of this political doctrine, holding the idea that the central managing body must be only of assistance. Uh, after all, this is uh, the word, of the meaning of the word Latin, in Latin of subsidiarity. The history of political subsidiarity dates uh, far back before the times of the European Union with the first uh, Vatican meeting. In fact, it dates back even to the times of Aristotle and uh, Platon. As for proportionality, this is uh, a uh, drive uh, which uh, was started by artists and mathematicians. What can we expect from our keynote speakers in our session on subsidiarity and proportionality? If uh, we use Orwell's uh, terms, uh, we uh, expect to hear from new speak, translation into old speak, the ideas that will be put forth because it is the new speak which uh, pushes citizens away. I would like to remind the four keynote speakers that, I, that they have only seven minutes to make their interventions. Uh, and uh, I will use all my powers as a moderator to keep the time. Our first keynote speaker is Mr. Franz Timmermans, the first vice president of the European Commission, commissioner on better regulation, interinstitutional relations, the rule of law, and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. He uh, can talk about subsidiarity from both sides as a deputy in the parliament, as a member of parliament and as a minister of foreign affairs in the Netherlands. And now as a 
a commissioner for better regulation in the European Commission. From November on, he has been leading the working group on subsidiarity and proportionality. The final report will be issued on the 15th of July. Mr. Timmermans, you have the floor. Thank you for this kind introduction. You know, at some point, um, George Bernard Shaw um, wrote a note to his arch enemy, Winston Churchill, inviting him to the opening night of his new play. And he wrote to uh, Churchill, Prime Minister, here is an invitation to the opening night of my newest play, and I include an invitation for a friend, always assuming you have a friend. Um, whereupon Churchill wrote back to him, um, saying, Dear Mr. Shaw, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Sadly, I'm not available for the opening night, but I will consider coming to the second show, always assuming there will be a second show. Um, <laughs> the task force is not a one-off. Once we present our report on the 15th of July to President Juncker, that's not the end of it. This is, would be my first remark uh, this morning, because this is work in progress. What we propose is not a revolution, it is an evolution. It is looking at our procedures, it is looking at how we do things now, it is taking note of the dissatisfaction in member states and in national parliaments and trying to address those issues uh, by changing the way we work, by changing the way we work together, and by perhaps also looking at new procedures that could help us improve the quality of our work and also accommodate some of the concerns that have been raised uh, by uh, national parliaments. For me, um, this task force is not about finding a new definition of subsidiarity and proportionality. That would be a complete waste of time. There are cupboards full of books trying to find the final definition of subsidiarity. Nobody's ever succeeded. And we are, we are modest enough to understand that it will, not, um, it will not be one of the things we get done. So let's just be practical about these things. And um, uh, I am I'm very fortunate to have a, a very strong group of people on my task force helping me to do that. Um, uh, once we have drawn our conclusions, we'll, which will be on the way we work today and how we can improve that, on increasing the buy-in of not just national parliaments, but also local and regional authorities, uh, who very often are the end users of the products we produce at the European level, and also on looking at policy areas where perhaps um, European action in the foreseeable future is not warranted. I think to try and translate the, one of the basic principles of this commission, of the Juncker Commission, big on big things and small on small things, into concrete steps on how we work um, and on uh, defining which issues might no longer be um, uh, on the top of our agenda so the commission will not take initiatives in that area is also a way of improving uh, the situation. Now, our conclusions will, will, will be reflected, I think, in the address President Juncker will give on the State of the Union in the European Parliament in September. And although the European Parliament is not part of the task force, I'm quite sure that once the report of the task force is on the table, the European Parliament will be an integral part of our debates on how we will implement um, uh, the uh, conclusions of the task force. Um, I also want to call upon you, those of you who still have ideas that could be useful for the task force but have not had the opportunity yet to feed these ideas into the task force, please do so. Um, until the very end, we will take them on board and see how we can um, put them into our uh, report. Already we've received quite a lot of ideas that you will see duly reflected in our report, but if, there's a, if there are more ideas, then please do that. Uh, my final remark is this. Um, I think it would, be, um, it would be a waste of time to have a fundamental debate on um, uh, competences, on redefining elements of the treaty, etc. There, there are no taboos in the task force. So if, if conclusions come up that would warrant treaty change in the future, they might come up. 
But that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is practical solutions to make sure that citizens see their ideas and their concerns better reflected in not just the products we produce, but also the way we produce them. And there, there I believe that there is no antagonism between the roles of national parliaments and European institutions, whether it's the Commission, the European Parliament, or the Council. Only if we work together on issues that manifestly cannot be solved by member states on their own can we produce the support, can we generate the support in the European public for the European project. It is ab abundantly clear to me that there is no way we can tackle the migration issue if we don't have real European solutions for that challenge. It is clear to me that security can only be dealt with at the European level, whether it's internal security but also uh, external security. It's very clear to me that if we don't improve the functioning of the internal market, if we don't invest in the fourth industrial revolution and its opportunities, if we don't offer uh, some protection of our citizens against the risks and the challenges of globalization, if we don't do all these things at the European level, then we will all fail because individually member states simply are not in a position, given the scale of the problem, to do it on their own. That is the spirit within which we operate. That is the spirit within which we have worked together in the task force. And I look forward to discussing the results with you after the report has been, um, has been written. And I'm sure that both the, the, the Austrian and the Romanian presidency uh, will work with us to make sure that we continue improving um, the workings of our institutions in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Timmermans. I'm certain that uh, uh, we will make use of uh, your proposal to send ideas to you. I would like to highlight what you said, that uh, this uh, is not a one-off act. You are looking for evolution, not revolution, and you are being pragmatic. Now we are going to hear from uh, Ms. Danuta, Dr. Danuta Hubner, chairperson of the Committee on Constitutional Affairs. She also has experience from the two sides on applying the principle of political subsidiarity, first as a Minister of European Affairs in, Affairs in Poland, and before that, Deputy Minister, and afterwards as the first uh, Polish Commissioner on Trade and Policy, and then as a member of the European Parliament. Mrs. Hubner, you have the floor. That uh, Franz Timmermans didn't use 30 seconds, so I hope you will allow me to use those 30 <laughs> seconds. I, I would like to, to, to start uh, uh, by, by saying that, and of course, we are not here to talk about the treaties, but when we reflect on subsidiarity, we, of course, have in the back of our head uh, the fact that treaties lay the foundations uh, for different roles and powers of all institutions, uh, including national parliaments in the European legislative process, or indeed more even in decision-making uh, process. I also think that it is important from time to time to say loudly that we have a world-class standards and that we have practices, also world-class practices, in legislative drafting, in impact assessment, in openness of the process, and when it comes to consultations also with re uh, interest representatives with regard to access to documents. So I think a lot exists in our system that is supporting the uh, subsidiarity. And we have also interinstitutional agreement between the three institutions on better lawmaking uh, that has, I think, strongly uh, improved or strengthened uh, deeply those rules and standards and also uh, practices. And let me, uh, of course, say also that um, uh, we as European Parliament and national uh, parliaments on the top of our own very specific uh, roles and powers that we have, we have also this joint extremely important responsibility for ensuring the democratic legitimacy of the process. And in some areas, as you know, we also face the challenge of double uh, legitimacy to, to cope with. Now on subsidiarity, I, I would like to say that it has, this concept has been uh, with us as a concept throughout the European integration and uh, history, and I agree fully with Franz uh, Timmermans, maybe uh, Professor Semov would be of different view, that we don't have to go to look at for the definition, because I think that core principles of subsidiarity are so basic that nobody can deny their value. 
and the real issue is the implementation of the subsidiarity. So that's why I think the challenge throughout the history of European integration, the challenge has always been to how to turn it into a practical concept reflecting European Union political uh, values. But we must not forget uh, that subsidiarity, that's one thing which I want to, to say clearly, that subsidiarity is not about doing what we want at local, region, national, European uh, level, but about doing our part in, in this of common objectives at all levels of European uh, governance, and I think we, we should always be aware of, of, of that. And we have um, uh, in, in various institutions, various levels of uh, governance, uh, various stages of legislative process which are involved in our reflection on subsidiarity. And that's why some coordination among all mechanisms upholding subsidiarity is certainly, uh, is certainly uh, needed. And that's why task force work is highly appreciated by European Parliament um, in this context. And we regret, uh, or some of us regret, that the format chosen has not allowed us to participate. But I agree, I respond to Franz Timmermans, we are absolutely ready to continue working with you closely with, within COSAC format, within whatever format will, uh, will be uh, applied in the future. We have to discuss it together. We want to be uh, in. in. And as I have limited time for the introductory comments, I would like to address directly several issues which I think do not pop up as very important for you when you are focusing very often on procedures, uh, which uh, you have the right to, to do. Uh, but I think um, uh, that it is uh, important maybe just to, to talk about something which I think could have some value added also to your reflection. So first, I would say that um, uh, the European um, institutions, the Parliament, the Commission, but also so the Council, we have developed a lot of practices already to protect, protect subsidiarity from the very early stage of legislation. And I think here uh, that I can say uh, it's true for Commission, it's true for us, that there is a strong vocation there without any uh, doubt. Every year now we have this uh, joint declaration of the Parliament Council and the Commission on the annual work program, where I can assure you that subsidiarity features there are very, very high, high in line with the interinstitutional agreement on better lawmaking. And as of next year, we will move to strategic programming, preserving hopefully uh, the same uh, approach. And let me also assure uh, you that as, as Parliament, uh, we look uh, with all attention into recent opinions, even if very often uh, they are very far from necessary threshold, but for us they are always an important element of uh, information. The next issue in the context of subsidi subsidiarity is uh, uh, that you raise also at national level, I think quite frequently, the comment on the choice of the legal form uh, for a new legislation between a directive or a framework directive and, and or a regulation. And of course, we, we all know that finally the choice that the Commission is making, the legal basis, depends usually on the policy area. And there are areas where we have to go for full harm harmonization. In other areas, we don't have to. Uh, directives have to be transposed, of course, and they give what you think, uh, when we agree with you, uh, a space at national level for debate, for reflection, that will raise awareness also of the uh, people at national level, which I think is extremely good. But we also see that very often this debate and this transposition leads to a lot of gold plating, which I think is, is not uh, good from the point of view uh, of the uh, quality of the uh, legislation. Uh, then a few words also on the early warning system, in addition to what you are discussing, the procedure which, where you know European Parliament has been supporting you on many issues from the day uh, one. Uh, this procedure, I think, could benefit largely from improved dialogue between national parliaments and European institutions, from intensity of contacts, which there is a space to make it more intense, and also better exchange of uh, documents. And then I think if we could better focus our interparliamentary meetings, it's up to us, the European Parliament, to propose a better focus for those annual uh, meetings. This, I think, could also help with regard to the uh, recent opinions of subsidiarity. 
still on, on this early warning uh, system. I think we should also take into account when we try to improve it that it should not lead to more lengthy process, legislative process. Uh, we, we know that it's already very long in the European uh, Union. So I think good balance is needed here. And also we have to take into account the workload in the European Commission if we, uh, if we go if too far with, with the proposed uh, reform of this uh, system. Then I also think if I could just because we are all reflecting very often with you why in, the, in those opinions, recent opinions, you go very often beyond and you talk about the uh, uh, issues which do not belong to subsidiarity. And, and I think because we do not have a good uh, dialogue on the future of Europe, we need more real debates, we need more clarity among ourselves also where we want to go uh, together. And then if we have this dialogue uh, and, and this discussion, uh, then probably it would be easier to focus on subsidiarity in those opinions, but I know from colleagues from many national channels, from many national chambers that this subsidiarity early warning system is practically very often the only channel for you to make the comments on the political priorities of Europe and the future of Europe in general. So here I think we have to look at it more uh, 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 with more attention. And then, uh, of course, respecting and caring about subsidiarity implies what Franz Timmermans mentioned, that uh, and one of solution does not exist. This is a living and will always be a living uh, process, and I'm sure that we will work on this uh, together. You cannot just by one, uh, with all due respect to the task force and the report, we cannot probably fix all the imperfections of the subsidiarity with, with one uh, of a uh, process or, or event. And not to conclude, let me say just one more thing. I think when we pass the, the laws, uh, we must make sure that they meet subsidiarity standards. That's, uh, I think, the starting point uh, of our discussion. But then we must also, through the, uh, as parliamentarians, through the oversight of our executive, which includes also the European Commission, but it's also national uh, governments, which is uh, extremely uh, important, uh, ensure that uh, also the implementation is in line with those standards. So on this, we, we, we are ready to, uh, to work with, uh, with you also in the future, how to make sure that implementation works. Thank you very much for your question. Time passes differently for different people, uh, Shakespeare said. You have two minutes more. No, no but I am a combination of politicians. Благодаря ви, професор Хевнер. Впрочем, ценно отбелязване, че принципа е ясен и по него няма спорно става дума за неговото приложение. Thank you, Professor Hübner. Hübner, it is an important principle, however, we have to follow the rules. We have to pay more attention to parliamentary debates. Indeed, Europe has a lot of positive achievements in its history of legislative efforts. And now the next speaker is Mr. Bastian van Appeldorf, Chair of the Standing Committee of the European Affairs. And in the Dutch Senate, he has also been teaching political economy in Amsterdam. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, the title of this session is EU Interparliamentary Cooperation in the context of the debate on subsidiarity and proportionality. And this, of course, touches upon the core business of COSAC. We are a forum of interparliamentary cooperation within the EU, and we seek to strengthen this cooperation and make it more effective in the firm belief that national parliaments have a crucial role to play in bolstering democratic legitimacy of the EU. Indeed, without strengthening, without a strengthening of the role of national parliaments in EU governance, it is hard to see how we can tackle the EU's democratic deficit and ensure that the EU is seen as representing and working for its citizens. The principles of subsidiarity and proportionality are a necessary condition for the democratic legitimacy of EU governance, as decision-making should be as close as possible to the citizen and in proportion to democratically chosen goals. Hence, our need as national parliaments to reinforce our cooperation in this area. So for these reasons, I'm keen to see the report of the task force on doing less more efficiently. But I also want to stress that this important work cannot just be left to the task force. 
Indeed, it is a marathon that we have to run together. Also, um, as the Dutch delegation mentioned in its letter to the COSAC working group, we consider the task force and its result not as the end of the debate, but as a contribution to work in progress, a part of the ongoing efforts of national parliaments to improve their involvement in the European legislative process. So COSAC by now has a rich history of seeking to bolster the role of national parliaments in the EU through exchanging best practices, uh, information, and for instance, regarding improving uh, the yellow card procedure. But we do need the cooperation of the European Commission and the support of the European Parliament. And looking at, um, at Danuta, I, I have to say that I welcome that the European Parliament has recently adopted a resolution that recognizes the obstacles that national parliaments encounter and that shows support for many of the remedies that national parliaments have suggested. So this support is very welcome, but now we need to take a real step forward. So to make it more concrete and looking uh, to my left, uh, Mr. Timmermans, let us now finally, after talking about it for years, um, exclude the recess period from the eight weeks in, in the yellow card procedure. And I here also refer to um, uh, paragraph 2.4 of the contributions of this COSAC that will hopefully be adopted um, after, uh, after this session. Uh, so I hope that this is also what the task force will propose. Similarly, I call upon the task force to include proportionality um, as part of the argumentation that one can make as national parliaments in the yellow card procedure. The way European institutions uh, respond to actions of national parliaments have in the past too often given the impression that national parliaments are still not taken seriously. An attitude, I think, that uh, the EU can ill afford, but that also national parliaments we should not allow to persist. The Commission's responses to, to reasoned opinions um, and, and to yellow card procedures are, I think, an example of what I mean. In our view, um, assessing subsidiarity and proportionality is a political assessment and one that should as such be left to national parliaments to make. The Dutch Senate, as I assume do all other chambers, doesn't issue reasoned opinions lightly. We assume that the Commission has done its work and has deemed the proposal indeed to be in line with uh, the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality. But it can happen that from our national perspective, we disagree with the Commission. So we expect the Commission also to assume that we have done our work as national parliaments as well. And on this basis, engage in an open and proper dialogue with us. Such a proper dialogue is sometimes lacking in the political dialogue as well. The Commission responses often uh, take too long and are too general in nature not providing the detailed answers to our questions that we would expect. Whereas we do get, tend to get such answers from our own government, in the case of the Netherlands, usually within four to six weeks. So in the Dutch Senate, we often tend to prefer to have a dialogue with our own national government on their interpretation and appreciation of the proposal instead of with the Commission. And that is, in a way, a pity that we do not have the Commission as well. So in order to further improve relations between the Commission and national parliaments, parliaments, we need to build trust, which takes time and proof of goodwill. But we are happy that under Vice President Timmermans, many initiatives have been taken to improve the relations with national parliaments, like more availability of commissioners to come to, cap to national capitals to explain policy and proposals, and indeed the promise of faster and more detailed replies to our opinion. And there has been progress in this re regard, um, but we are not there yet. Um, but here I do welcome the proposal made by the Danish delegation, for instance, to the task force for a code of conduct on good and timely responses uh, to national parliaments within the political dialogue on the part of the Commission. Another proposal that has been tabled by, I think, several delegations is to introduce a second subsidiarity check at the end of the negotiations and that might be a possibility. But arguably, that might not be necessary if we make EU decision-making fully transparent, which is also essential in any case
for national parliaments to play our role in scrutinizing and controlling uh, our governments in council negotiations. Mm. As you know, the Dutch delegation here, with the support of many of you, has been active in seeking to put the issue of transparency high on our agenda. And here I want to thank all of those delegates who attended our successful side session yesterday. And following this, I encourage all of you to continue to address the issue of transparency with your respective uh, governments. We should be proactive here because this issue won't solve uh, its, uh, itself by itself and we need to exercise collective pressure. Um, um, and here again, I recall that 26 delegations of chambers of national parliaments um, in the European Union have signed a letter with four questions and we're still awaiting a full point by point answer. If the Council takes the role of national parliament seriously, I would say that this is the time to show this. Finally, I want to end by emphasizing that we can also do more, can we also be more effective in influencing EU decision making if we do more collectively, um, as we are now doing with regard to transparency. So in this regard, we should also be looking at ourselves and how we can make more effective use of the tools that are at our disposal. For instance, even before the eight weeks period, we could share each other's priority lists, we could collectively share information as clusters of interest on specific topics, such as transparency. Um, we could do this also via national rapporteurs or exchange information through IPEX and through our permanent representatives, parliamentary representatives in Brussels, and also maybe together with the European Parliament. In short, and in conclusion, we also need to take ownership as national parliaments. We need to put in the effort ourselves and we need to continue to strive for an EU decision making in which national parliaments can play their key role to ensure that EU governance is democratically legitimate and in line with the principles of proportionality and subsidiarity. Thank you. And thank you. Sorry for going slightly over time. Thank you, Mr. Appledorn. Indeed, the national parliaments play Key, a key role in the legitimacy of the European Union. They need to be taken seriously, you're right. Some practical suggestions are also important, the eight weeks period and the exclusion of recess. Indeed, you're right that uh, jointly we achieve better results. And uh, in this context, the Bulgarian presidency's motto does not come in uh, by pure chance. And our last speaker is Professor Atanas uh, Semov. He teaches European law at the Sofia University. Uh, his thesis was on the European Court. Um, he also has political experience. He used to be the Deputy Speaker of Parliament in 2010. But of course, uh, the seven books he wrote in uh, European law, more than 50 articles and 12 collections of, uh, of reports. Moreover, he is, uh, like me, a graduate of the School of Classical Languages, so he knows what subsidiary means. Thank you, uh, Professor Hubner, Commissioner Timmermans, dear colleagues. I'm firmly convinced that to love Europe also means to be brave enough and criticize its weaknesses. I love Europe and I hope that I can transfer this feeling of love for Europe to my students. That's why I would like to be very open and honest with you today. The main principle of the European Union is to take decisions closer to the citizens. And this is also done uh, through the principle of subsidiarity. However, I think that we have to ask ourselves the question whether all decisions in the European Union are really made as closely as possible to the citizens, and most of all, whether citizens themselves uh, feel that decisions are close. I would be very clear on this. The sentiment is still that Brussels is very far away. Yesterday, I came back from uh, yet another cycle of uh, um, studies uh, uh, for the one-year continuing education program of Bulgaria for EU law. And uh, this is a continuing education program for judges and lawyers. And I can uh, assure you that uh, those students do not feel the decisions are close to them. 
I have been uh, deputy speaker of the Bulgarian parliament before, but uh, today I'm speaking as a university professor. That's why I would like to share with you that uh, in order to better understand the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality, we have to insist on the principle uh, of legitimate uh, trust and legitimate confidence. And uh, I believe that this concept should be understood uh, as a democratic concept, uh, as trust in democracy. It's really important for the citizens of the Europe European Union to trust the legislation of the European Union and to embrace it as their own legislation and not as Brussels legislation, somebody else's legislation. But not, it's not always the case that they feel the legislation is their own. And uh, I would like to reiterate uh, uh, what was just said uh, about the report uh, of the achievements of the Bulgarian presidency. I think that we contributed to en enhancing the legitimacy of Europe, especially in the light of the upcoming European uh, Parliament uh, um, elections next year. Let's not be, uh, let's not have illusions. The debate on the budget and on the uh, financing of political parties uh, uh, in Europe uh, is not enough. Many of you, uh, members of the national parliaments, will probably run in the European elections uh, next year. That's why I would like to share with you today that the principle of proportionality still needs to be reinforced. The institutions of the European Union still take measures that go beyond what is purely necessary to achieve an otherwise legitimate goal. And national parliaments could be more proactive and could be, in this way, more successful in uh, contributing to this goal. As an example of a union uh, legal act that creates uh, the feeling of overregulation by Brussels, uh, I'm afraid that we can uh, give, it as an example, the GDPR, which came into force uh, recently. I would not even start the topic uh, of the Dublin regulation uh, and the discussions of that uh, uh, regulation is still far away from um, the uh, everyday concerns of citizens. We all understand uh, that uh, uh, efficiency is a cornerstone of subsidiarity. But if the um, European integration model is based uh, on equal rules in many subject matters, we know that from uh, uh, the doctrine of uh, the Luxembourg Court uh, of the Legal Union, it is of key importance uh, that we should have democratic legitimacy. And I think that the subsidiarity principle should serve democratic legitimacy the most. But have we achieved this to a a sufficient extent. I believe that uh, after the mechanism of prior cons consultations with national parliaments was adopted, the drafts submitted by the Commission uh, are much more in line with the principle of subsidiarity. But I believe the other uh, uh, claim is also uh, true. The functioning of this mechanism did not lead to many examples of uh, serious reaction from national parliaments. And in the cases where there was such a reaction, did the Commission pay enough attention to those reactions. I believe that uh, we have to honestly ask ourselves if the 11 years of this mechanism and the three yellow cards which resulted from it, are those three yellow cards enough or not? For those 11 years, probably there were more than three cases uh, where the Commission went beyond what was necessary or what was acceptable. I wouldn't be able to give a definite answer to this uh, question. And uh, uh, Commissioner Timmerners, uh, Timmermans is really um, uh, a person that I respect gratefully. But I should be very honest with him that so many years uh, uh, after, European citizens re really need more action from the European Commission and from the national parliaments alike. And the national parliaments will really create this uh, sentiment that the uh, uh, law in Europe is for the citizens and not it not it not Brussels law, because if it's subsidiar uh, if we uh, apply subsidiarity, if we apply honesty with the citizens, then the European Union uh, will have its meaning and it will be a union of countries and citizens. Thank you, Professor Semov. Um, I really had the same feeling uh, like you expressed that Brussels is far away. And uh, we have the topic of interparliamentary cooperation in the context of the debate on subsidiarity and proportionality as a topic of the panel. Imagine how uh, people listening to the radio right now understand this uh, title. 
uh, you are really correct that uh, decision making should be closer to the citizens and democratic legitimacy should be further developed for Europe. And efficiency is really important in applying principles such as subsidiarity. Now I have to uh, give the floor back to Mr. Vigenin to moderate the debate. And I would like to remind you uh, once again, uh, rephrasing Shakespeare, probably um, it's not by chance. Shakespeare says it's better to be early three hours earlier than be later by a minute when it will be too late. And for the purposes of this uh, discussion, you should finish your interventions 30 uh, seconds early, then be one second late. Mr. Vigenin, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Volchev. Today's uh, discussion shows that uh, when journalists are moderating, uh, we have more time for discussion and uh, we have more time for our uh, debate now. So we have two minutes per intervention for this debate, which does not mean that you should necessarily exhaust the two minutes, but you have this option. Without further ado, I open the debate and I give the floor to Mr. Jean Bizet. You have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chairman. Well, as we've heard several times over the last 48 hours, Brexit should also be an opportunity to rethink how the EU operates and to rethink, and well, and subsidiarity is at the heart of our thinking on that today. Any sharing of sovereignty needs to be done to address practically uh, specific needs, which Professor Simova pointed out in saying that it should work for the legitimacy, uh, for democratic legitimacy. And this should not be imposed upon the states. It needs to be based on treaties if you want to take a federalist approach, because the union is above all a federation of national states and is not a federal state in the classical sense of the word. So the purpose of European construction could be boiled down to the idea of uniformization, if you like. Harmonization and convergence should leave room for maneuver for member states. But be careful, the subsidiarity principle should not be confused with a limited vision of sovereignty. Our regular usage of subsidiarity has led us to understand the procedure itself. Now, the Commission now should justify any use of legislative tools and should give us more time to reply, and the Commission themselves should then be more reactive. We should also ensure that we have a monitoring power over delegated acts and implementing acts. And we could also consider the orange card system outlined in the Tusk package of 2016. And I would recommend this to COSAC. The Commission will commit itself to taking on board motivated decisions, even if the threshold is not reached. A second part in the declaration would be be in stating that it's possible for parliaments to look at the text again on the basis of subsidiarity once uh, substantial changes have been made to a text during negotiations in council or parliament, and the joint declaration would then uh, uh, make it a necessary review of the treaties. Thank you. I give the floor to Hans Peter Portman. Chair, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Switzerland is a reliable partner to promoting democracy, the rule of law, human rights, stability and prosperity in Europe and the world. Also, Switzerland participates on a voluntary basis in the EU's relocation and settlement programs and in the European Asylum Support Office. Switzerland has contributed close to 30 billion euros into European infrastructure and to numerous EU regional projects. Ladies and gentlemen, Switzerland is for the EU the third most and second most important trading partner in goods and services, and the EU makes yearly a surplus on trading of 100 billion euros. 320 people cross the border to work in Switzerland every day, and also approximately 1.4 million EU citizens live in Switzerland and bring during their work time and their pension life billions of good, strong Swiss francs into your countries. 
May you also allow me to remind you that Europe is not only the EU, located in the heart of our continent and with a history of 730 years, Switzerland has a democratic sovereignty and maybe we also have a good spirit of valuable Europe as you have too. Therefore, we appreciate very much to anticipate in your COSAC meetings. The EU has close cooperation with other European associations like the EAA and EFTA, and soon we will welcome also United Kingdom in our family of bilateral partnerships to the EU. So maybe it could be for all of us a valuable profit if COSAC would open its agenda also to some partnerships issues. I'm coming to the end, dear colleagues of the national parliaments. You are not only the bridge to the people. As the representative of your national citizens, you are the stakeholders of your union. In this sense, I wish you the courage to fulfill more efficient your powerful role and to set the guidelines for the strategy of the EU in the upcoming COSAC meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Portman. Jaroslav Obremski has the floor. I have seen an advertisement of a chair that it was environmentally friendly and it was made of plastic and another one that it's environmentally friendly because it was made of wood. It reminded me of how subsidiarity is understood in Brussels. Even if we are successful with the yellow card, we hear from commissioners, I have figures for this, uh, they say, so what? You have a yellow card, so what? And besides, the deadlines for the yellow card is way too, lo too short. I'm very glad Mr. Timmermans is open. Uh, he's, he's declaring his openness. I'm, I, I do appreciate it to quote Orwell, uh, the, uh, the uh, task force uh, 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 results uh, and uh, reassure us and hopefully the EU will turn from big brother to real partner. Uh, the uh, spirit and the second subsidiarity check are important. Uh, the green and the uh, red cards uh, need, uh, reinforced, need to be reinforced. The European uh, Parliament needs to be turned into a real Parliament with clearly defined uh, uh, powers and uh, delineated so, uh, and also control over commissioners. Mr. Hempel from the Czech Republic and Mr. Lopatka from Austria, uh, our Dutch and Danish uh, uh, colleagues have done a great job. Uh, I have a lot of respect uh, for the task force. I still have 30 seconds, I see. So to quote Shakespeare, uh, well, the rest is silence. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Obremski. Now, Peter Luch has the floor. Thank you, Voorzitter. Uh, Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Timmermans, good afternoon. The launch of the task force is to be welcomed. Local and regional governments getting involved in the policy development of the EU and increasing subsidiarity is good and to be welcomed. I would call for a greater role in the regional uh, authorities in the developing of EU legislation. And the key to the subsidiarity issue lies in by increasing the role played by the regions. Mr. Timmermans, Europe is more than just the sum of member states. It's a network of regions, nations, member states. They all have their own structure and identity. I'm Flemish, then European. Mr. Timmermans, you can increase the support for Europe by listening to what the regions have to say. You are committed to dialogue. Now, I don't, the fact that you don't want to directly negotiate with Catalonia, it's a strong economic region, a pro-European region, and Europe is silent about the arrest of political uh, Catalans and their leaders, and is silent on the position of the Spanish government on their independent efforts. You quoted Winston Churchill. Well, I can do that too. It takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. Wilt you the regio Now, do you want to have, if you want the regions to be more involved, you must listen to them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luis. Now, Arunas Gilonas, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Does Brussels have too much power? Is our freedom of action constrained? 
are member states' views almost never taken into account while revising the context of legislative proposals at the EU level? Should our capitals take back control? I'm sure these questions are all too familiar for the MPs present in this meeting. If not given enough attention, the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality can indeed become an object of manipulation and a powerful tool in the hands of populists. There have been positive developments towards greater involvement of national parliaments in the EU decision-making process. However, the dialogue between national parliaments and EU institutions could be developed even further. National parliaments expect that their views will be taken into account by revising the contents of the legislative proposals. The Commission's annual reports on relations with national parliaments lack information about the real impact of opinions issued by national parliaments on the Commission's legislative initiatives. What opinions of which parliaments, in which way? The main dialogue should be between the parliament and the government. On the other hand, we, as well as other national parliaments, believe that political dialogue developed through the use of the green card is a useful tool for interparliamentary cooperation. This tool aimed at a greater involvement of national parliaments in the EU decision-making should be further implemented in the framework of the existing treaties. They may therefore be a case for structures other than COSAC, where cooperation and coordination can be discussed to ensure efficiency and avoid unnecessary fragmentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now a big jump from northeast to southwest. Margarida Marques, Portugal. Muito obrigada, Presidente. Uh, eu queria saudar... Thank you, Chairman. Well, first of all, I would like to welcome the fact that we're discussing this here in COSAC and welcome the idea of the task force. Thank you to Franz for all the detailed information you provided on how the task force will function. Now, the reason I'm asking for the floor is to raise the following issue. I know that the task force uh, has to work uh, beyond the deadline proposed, but I have a direct question for Franz Timmermans. Does the European Commission plan to carry out a structured evaluation of the impact uh, when opinions issued by national parliaments as part of protocol number two. We respect our obligations, we respect our mandate as a national parliament, but I would like to know what will happen to these opinions that arrive to the European Commission. Will the Commission be evaluating those contributions to the national parliaments? My second comment is a question of communication. I think that we really do need a communication strategy to dismantle myths and what it is we all mean when we say Europe. First myth you hear quite often in Portugal and elsewhere as well is the fact that Brussels interferes in national policies. Another myth is the democratic deficit that we hear talking, people talking about. I think that a true communication strategy uh, based on subsidiarity could reduce the democratic deficit or at least help tackle it in some way. And then the third myth is the erosion of sovereignty. I think a real communication strategy would allow us to really clarify all these points, clarify the role of the national parliaments, and I think that a communication strategy would be of help to us as well to better tackle these three myths. Now the incoming presidency, Mr. Christian Buchmann. Thank you, Herr uh, ich Thank you. I would like to thank Vice President Timmermans for his uh, pragmatic approach to the task force. I think that's the right way forward. And if I understand correctly, then the task force uh, also shares the understanding that the EU, when it comes uh, to external borders, migration, uh, completing the internal market, all the big issues, uh, digitalization, well, that uh, 
the member states uh, and regions need to maintain high levels of uh, competence in those areas in order to, for the right decisions to be taken. Uh, we heard from Sobna that uh, there is, of course, gold plating regularly. But uh, if we have the right breakdown between what is done at EU level and what is done at the level of the member states and uh, regions, then I think uh, gold plating can, to a large extent, be avoided. Uh, so united uh, in our variety, I think that is a, a good uh, a approach, uh, indeed, uh, to the future. If one were to choose one scenario, I would say that powers should remain with the regions uh, and the EU should tackle the overarching issues. We heard from Professor Semov as well about the breakdown. Uh, so between what happens at the EU level and the level of the member states and regions. Uh, and uh, I think that if we uh, follow that approach, uh, we can, we'll make a useful contribution. What has the floor? Dear Mr. Chairman, in order to offer a new angle to the discussion, the Parliament of Finland believes that the importance of subsidiarity and proportionality may be overstated. These are technical terms that are defined in the treaty. In our assessment, breaches of these principles are quite rare. We believe that the best way to address the concerns of national parliaments is to require policy coordination between parliaments and the governments before negotiations in the Council. It is unsustainable for parliamentary democracies to allow situations where governments and the parliaments to which they are ultimately responsible for openly disagree at the European level. In addition, in order to facilitate the national parliament's scrutiny of their own governments, more transparency is needed in the Council decision-making, as promoted, for example, by our Dutch and Danish colleagues over here. On doing less more efficiently, we consider that the Juncker Commission has largely shown the way forward. The volume of regulation has diminished and become more focused. When a member state proposes a new EU activity, it should always be expected to show why action on the European Union provides more added value than activity on the member state level. Thank you very much. Now back to Portugal, Maria Luiz Albuquerque, please. Obrigada, President. A discussão que estamos a ter aqui hoje. Thank you. The discussion held with this panel this afternoon is very timely. I note from the various comments made that we're all worried about the same thing. We want to win over our citizens for the European project and find a solution to the problem of a disenchantment or the feeling of distance amongst our population from politics. Not just local and regional and national politics, but also European politics. Uh, the way we legislate at our different levels and how we should cooperate is a very timely discussion. But I think our main concern should be to consolidate the European project so that we can effectively combat the emergence of populism and various forms of extremism, which represent a threat to all of us. If we work together, we can defend the, the idea that the European Union is there for the citizens and that uh, we are all the elected representatives of our citizens. It's true that we all bear a certain responsibility for how things are presented. When things aren't going well, we say it's your fault. Uh, when things are going well, we say, well, that's because of the mix of national uh, policies adopted. I think that that kind of politics can also undermine citizens' confidence in the Union. I think that we should also learn to better manage citizens' expectations of what Europe can do for them, while at the same time helping those who really believe in the European project. We need to convince everyone of the real advantages of the project in many uh, areas, uh, peace, of course, which was the first uh, objective, uh, but not the only objective, but in uh, economic prosperity and in social well-being, 
a real achievement in recent years, are all uh, real achievements. I think that we all have a responsibility in defending the EU. Let us shoulder those responsibilities. Now I give the floor to Mr. Rasmus Nordqvist, Denmark. Thank you very much. Um, this is indeed a very important discussion, and that's also why the Danish Parliament has been quite active and tried to participate as much as we could within the framework. I think what is important to, to understand also in this debate is that this is about subsidiarity, but it's also about the dynamics between the EU institution and the national institutions. I don't think that the national parliament's role should only be guardians of the subsidiarity principle, but also to play a more active role in, in the, the processes of legislation as such. Uh, therefore, we have put forward a number of, of uh, ideas that we hope the, the task force will look um, positively to. First of all, a new green card for the national parliaments, um, but also an enhanced yellow and orange card uh, procedure especially that it's not only subsidiarity we look into when we look at, at the yellow and orange card procedures. We also think it's important that the whole involvement in the, in the pre-processes, that the national parliaments play a role here, and that the commission should be quite actively uh, uh, looking to the national parliaments as well. Um, as my Dutch colleague were, were saying in the beginning, we have proposed also a code of conduct and I think that the Commission should, should look into this as well. They could, they could move on some of these proposals as of today. Um, and, and, and we think that would be good to have the open and timely information and discussion uh, between national parliaments and the institutions. And then there's the whole question of, of, of transparency. And I think that is so important that the national parliament get more access to documents from the Council but also, and, and this goes to the task force work, that we were told there would be a lot more transparency in the work in the task force, and we haven't really heard anything since the actual work started. So it would be nice also to hear where you are in the work in the task force as of now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Bernard Durkan, Ireland, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and I would like to start off by complimenting Mr. Timmerman on, on his work so far and uh, to, to support the concept of, of, of the task force. I think the sharing of sovereignty is always a very sensitive issue between nations, between people, between neighbourhoods from time to time, as we all know in public life. But we, we probably look at it in the wrong way. Uh, we, we, we tend to see it as a threat to each of us. We are all self-centred to some extent. But it should be looked at in another way. To my mind, it should be seen as being complementary to each other, because we can complement each other's sovereignty by engaging. The big threat that we have that I see emerging is the, the whole question of, about uh, populism and, and the, the, the runaway train. And I think that we have a job to do. It's, a, it's an old-fashioned job. We have to challenge. We have to engage in that debate. We cannot run away from that debate. We must stand up and spell it out and tell it as it is. And we must prove the point. There's no good engaging in propaganda. We must prove the point beyond any shadow of doubt that we are on the right road. Now, we might be always right, but we must engage in that debate. And we must be there at all times. Being absent and running away from it and failing to take our responsibilities will only give more credence and more impetus to the people who indulge in populism. Now, I would say, you know, at this stage, I think the European Commission itself has, has done a great deal of work as well in engaging with national parliaments. That is a huge improvement on 10 or 12 years ago. And I think that if that work continues, there'll be a better understanding at commission level of what the parliaments, the national parliaments, Parliaments think, and a better understanding at national parliaments as to what has to be done to, for Europe to go forward together. We, we, we need to take ownership ourselves, each and every one of us, in our national parliaments of the European project for the good of all. Thank you, Mr. Durkan. Now, Sabine Thier has. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Don't Thank you. As part of reform of French institutions on the 28th of June next I'll be presenting an information report on the role of national parliaments in the European decision-making process, which will address inter alia some of the questions we have been talking about here today. 
And the task force might be interested in some of them. First of all, the time period allowed national parliaments to check compliance with the principle of subsidiarity. I'm going to propose it be expanded to 12 weeks so that we have the time to conduct a thorough examination and coordinate with our peers in order to draw up common positions. Screening for subsidiarity is very often abused to express political disagreement. We think we should therefore further formalize the way in which account is taken of opinions expressed by national parliaments as part of political dialogue. The Commission should be required to respond within a reasonable period, and its response should be made public. Finally, national parliaments should not be co solely consigned to defending the interests of national parliaments. They ought to be able to call on the EU to legislate if they think the EU's intervention is necessary. For that reason, I propose that there be a parliamentary right of initiative comparable to the citizens' right of initiative. If a third of national parliaments call for it, the Commission would be obliged to provide a reasoned reply if it does not want to follow up on a demand. And if half of national parliaments make such a request, the Commission should then proceed to table a proposal within one year. Thank you. Merci. Now, Gerald Crogwell, Ireland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, too, would like to compliment uh, Vice President uh, Timmerman for the work of his task force and for the level of uh, cooperation and uh, uh, discussion that has existed around the task force. Um, my colleague uh, spoke about standing up and taking responsibility for what we do. And uh, an earlier uh, contributor made the point that when something is good, we claim ownership. When something is not great, we blame Europe. And this has to stop. This has to stop because we've seen some very high-profile populist people who worked hard to try and destroy this proje project. And once they got what they wanted, they walked away. Because the populist really doesn't want to win. They want to sit on the sidelines and cast stones at the rest of us. So we've got to uh, counter that. And we've got to counter it by developing a marketing program for Europe. We've got to bring responsibility down to the local authorities. It's all very well dealing with national uh, governments, but very often decisions that are taken in European legislation or directives that come from Europe affect local areas. And we must bring the decision-making down to those local areas. Uh, I support the eight weeks. Indeed, I would uh, prefer to see it 12 weeks. Uh, there was some discussion, Mr Timmermans, uh, about um, treaty changes. Can I make a plea here that we do nothing ever to cause a treaty change of any sort, because in my country we will need a referendum, and my God, we've seen what a referendum can do to the European project. So no treaty changes, please. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much. I think if it's up to us, we promise, but who knows? Then uh, Václav Hampel has the floor. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased that we have on several occasions mentioned that improvements in screening for subsidiarity is a process that is going to be ongoing and will not come to an end at the end of this task force's job. This was something that I feared. When the task force was set up, I was afraid that after six months, conclusions would be adopted, and that would be that. Uh, the conclusion would be that subsidiarity had been improved and uh, there was nothing more that needed to be done. So I'm very pleased that there is going to be continuity. At the same time, though, I would like to say that such continuity should not mean that nothing 
needs to be done at the moment. Uh, I think that the Commission has taken a leap forward. It has set up the group or the task force. That is a good thing. But for years here in Kozak, we have been discussing the need for concrete projects. And I think that we do feel a need uh, to be able to change things in concrete ways. And there have been various plans discussed here in uh, COSAC, and uh, I think that we had an issue, but that was resolved about uh, six months ago, and I'd like to thank the some 20 national parliaments uh, that contributed. Mr. Van Affeldorn has summed up uh, the input. There are a number of uh, more technical projects, but the more important ideas are that if a yellow card is issued, then there has to be a tangible effect as a result. That does not mean that national parliaments should have more power, but uh, their role is to improve democratic legitimacy, and in particular, the perception thereof by our populations. And I think that the European Commission should, should be prepared to respond concretely to a yellow card, and that would improve the democratic legitimacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Isabel Clock now. Dziękuję bardzo. Pani Przewodnicząc. Thank you very much, Chairman. Our main goal also as regards interparliamentary cooperation should be the democratic renewal of the European Union and bolstering its unity and uh, building upon uh, the achievements of its integration. However, the integration should still be founded upon the needs of the sovereign member states. The European project cannot be detached from uh, the democratic communities being national communities. Uh, European law cannot be beyond the impact of national parliaments. Uh, and I have to agree with Mr. Van Appeldon from the Netherlands. The example of the yellow of the yellow card, uh, which we see very ne negatively, it's not efficient at all. The European, the national parliaments have zero impact on the uh, on the uh, legislative process in Brussels. Uh, delegate uh, or posted workers are a very good example. This is a complete fiasco of the European Commission, because basically two member states took the whole decision against all the others uh, and against uh, the yellow card. And if we want to stay in the EU, and nas Polish nationals very much want, uh, and Polish population support it, support the European Union, we have to listen to the voice of national communities. And we need more justice and more fairness. But also we need more freedom for, uh, uh, for our citizens. The European Union uh, does not represent uh, the people, uh, but it has to, uh, it's obliged to, re to respect the national identities. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Clock. Now, Kelvin Hopkins, United. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Blago Daria, may I say, for the opportunity to speak very briefly. It has been a great pleasure to visit Bulgaria for a second time after a skiing holiday in nearby Vitosha in 1984. I have listened with great interest to all the contributions from delegates, but I thought it was perhaps not appropriate for me to express strong views on how the EU should function in the future, given that the United Kingdom would not be a member. However, as a passionate European in the broader cultural sense, I wish all fellow Europeans, both inside and outside the EU, a successful and prosperous future. I am sure, too, that the UK will have friendly and cooperative relations with our fellow Europeans for the long term, and there would be many matters on which good bilateral and multilateral arrangements will develop and be sustained. In conclusion, I should say that, unfortunately, the chair of our House of Commons European Scrutiny Committee, Sir William Cash, was unable to attend at the last minute, but I feel sure that he would have made some contribution to the debates and that he would wish you all well for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. I, I am sure that we'll continue to, to, to rely on your advice, even if you are not member in the future, but you will be able to participate in our events, I hope. Now, Mr. Piotr Apple has the floor. Bardzo dziękuję. 
Wszyscy jesteśmy tutaj wybrani w parlamentów demokratycznych. To speak for or against something. So the key question is: uh, Are we going in the direction of democracy or technocracy? If we want democracy, and we have um, a problem uh, because obviously the uh, uh, British referendum uh, has been a problem for us, then uh, let's try and deal with the uh, problem that we have with convincing our citizens. Um, if we are afraid of populists, then we means that our problem is to make people feel well in the EU. Um, it comes uh, with difficulty for us, apparently, to um, convince them that uh, it's a good thing. So the question is, are we going to uh, be focusing on um, um, the solutions? Uh, are we um, afraid of the voices expressed by the um, uh, people in the national uh, votes or in referenda? We should not be afraid of that. We should not be afraid of a green, a yellow, or a red card, because democracy is what has brought us here in the first place. And uh, democracy is the only or the best uh, uh, system that uh, um, we can uh, Accept. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Mr. Jak Madison, Estonia. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much, Vice President Timmermans, for coming here. Um, it was a bit uh, of a pity that we didn't see here, it, it didn't see you at the events in Estonia. No, now, the task force is definitely a step in the right direction. Thank you very much indeed to the Czech Senate for very concrete proposals on how to reform the EU and how to ensure more transparency. Also, a great many thanks to Austrian colleagues. Now, the task force doing less with more efficiency. It's a copy and paste from a development scenario suggested by President Juncker. He suggested five scenarios, and if I remember correctly, that was number four. It's a pity, therefore, that the other scenarios have not been discussed that much, or we haven't heard about them so much. I therefore get the impression that this one, the one from five, is actually a proposal from the Commission. So President Juncker suggested five, but picked one of them. So let's wait and see until July for the final report. I hope that there are going to be the final proposals on how to ensure better management in the EU. Now, the cards. The British colleagues suggested the red card a few years ago. Unfortunately, that's disappeared due to Brexit. I think that the red card should find its way to the task force um, report as well, because that would defi definitely improve subsidiarity and proportionality. Thank you, Mr. Madis. Now, Mr. Thomas Witsu to Estonia again. Thank you very much, Chair. First of all, I would like to express my thanks to Christian Vigenin. Thank you very much for this very constructive atmosphere at this Kozak. It's helped us a great deal. It's helped us to work effectively. Now, I would like to mention a um, slight problem in the work of the task force. 
When I was in the committee of the regions, I very often caught myself thinking about something. I was pondering on how the committee of the regions could work perhaps more effectively. Now, looking at this goal, doing more with less, I've got the opposite fears. I think one of the values of the European Union is about quality political dialogue. Effectiveness, what does that mean? Doing things quicker. That may imply that we might no longer have the time for political dialogue. So, talking about the goals of the task force, I would like to stress every, to everyone that we should do as much as possible and as little as necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we finish our debate with the European Parliament. Marie McGuinness, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. And I chose to be last because I wanted to respond uh, on behalf of the Parliament and to say very clearly that my job as Vice President is to have a dialogue with national parliaments, so I very much value all of the contributions that have been made here. And I would reflect on a few points. Uh, my colleague Danuta Hubner outlined very clearly our position on this issue. And we are all elected by citizens members of national parliaments and members of the European Parliament. So we have so much in common. I think we all realize that citizens uh, across member states are skeptical about politics. That isn't just about European politics, it's also feeding into national politics. We have a duty to defend our profession. I think we should do that more clearly because we play an important role in democracy and in uh, developing our countries. I would just put a rhetorical question to you that sometimes I hear that subsidiarity may be seen as a way to stop Brussels rather than as a tool for progress. We need to be clear about what our objectives are. But I very much hear the point that we need to be close to citizens. But sometimes when we talk in our regions, there is conflict between the local, the regional and the national, just as we have this issue with the European Parliament. Let us who are pro-European not feed into that as a negative. Uh, I think that would be very dangerous and indeed we're seeing some results. But also within our political families, those who belong to them, we need to ask ourselves, are we working effectively within our political families on European issues so that we avoid some of these conflicts? And I, I, I remark that one of the proposals uh, on the table reforming the agriculture policy um, suggests that more control is given back to member states. But what I'm hearing from lobby groups and stakeholders is that they're not so sure that they want the member state to have control. So there aren't just two sides to this story. It is a multifaceted one. But thank you so much for your contributions, and I think we can work better together. Thank you very much, Mrs. McGuinness. Excellent uh, f f finish of our debate. I would like to thank you for the interesting opinion expressed and for the fact that we were very disciplined in this debate. Um, before I uh, give back the word to Mr. Volchev, uh, I would like to mention that he criticized our title. I mean, during the debate, I formulated a compromise solution. If you, I hope you like it, kind of a subsidiarity and proportionality, to be or not to be. I think in the spirit of Shakespeare, <laughs> I hope it's more understandable. Now, Mr. Volchev, you have the floor back. I am certainly not going to criticize you. I am impressed. 20 contributions and we kept time perfectly. I can see you have a potential, Mr. Viganin, when, if and when you give up politics, you can be a radio journalist. So let us very briefly give the floor to the keynote speakers, two, two and a half minute, minutes each because Professor Hübner had to leave. So, Professor Samov, you have the floor. We start from the back. 
I was hoping to be the last again because there's no doubt that everyone present here would like to hear first and foremost uh, Commissioner Timmermans. What I want to say at the very beginning, though, is that in this hall, we all clearly felt the commitment we all have to the improvement of the mechanism of control in implementing the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality. Whether the national parliaments would uh, have more time, not eight, but 12 weeks, I'm not sure this is the solution. I fear something else is needed. Perhaps uh, an important aspect of this solution would be for the Commission to be more sensitive uh, when the national parliaments express certain concerns, even if they don't have one quarter, one third of the votes in order uh, to present the yellow card or um, red card or when the Commission presents its impact assessment, impact assessment uh, sometimes uh, touching upon national competences. But fi finally, I'd like to end by saying that in Europe, we, s we are still short of a feeling of an open and honest dialogue specifically on the most sensitive issues. I think there is still a lot that can be done there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Two and a half minutes for Mr. Appleton. Actually, three minutes because the professor uh, was rather concise and we still have a few seconds left. I'm not sure whether I need the three minutes, but I want to thank everyone for, the, um, for their contributions. I think we had a, a, a good debate and there's a lot of agreement here in, in, this, in this room about how to move forward. I do want to say that I, that I somewhat disagree with um, the representative from Portugal who talked about the myth of the democratic deficit and that we just simply need a, a more effective communication strategy. So I want to refer to what Professor Semov said before in his contribution, that there are a lot of people in the EU who feel that the EU is too distant, that decision-making is not close enough to, to them. And I think they're not just a victim um, of, uh, uh, of a myth. Um, uh, there is a problem with regard to democratic legitimacy in the EU, and I think it is for us to, to, to effectively address that challenge. And, Part of it has to do with a lack of transparency, which makes it more difficult for governments to, to exercise control and, and our scrutiny functions vis-a-vis -vis our own governments, but also for citizens to have access to, to information. Uh, we've talked about, uh, about that before and, and the limite documents, and that, that is a problem. Um, so, so I here I want to thank those uh, delegations, such as the Czech one and the, Dan uh, the Danish one, for their support also with regard to, to our initiative regarding, regarding transparency. Um, um, and I also very much agree with what uh, the, the, the Czech delegates said, uh, as I said, as we said before, um, that what the task force is doing is not going to be um, the, the end of it. Um, and also that it's important that in terms of the yellow card procedure, it's not just about, about the time in terms of, of the eight weeks period which should be extended by not including the recess, but that also what is important that um, the Commission actually takes into account um, uh, our reasoned opinions and responds to it in an effective way and shows and explains to what extent um, it, it, it has done something with it uh, or, or not. Um, let me just see, I mean, from, from both from the Danish uh, delegation and the French delegation, uh, uh, the, uh, the issue of the Green Guard was, was again tabled. So I think that's something that we could further talk about in, in COSAC. What do we actually mean by the Green Guard? What does it mean to have a right of initiative, not the way the European Parliament has it or the, or, or, or the European Commission? Uh, or the European Commission has it, but in a way that maybe the citizens of, of the EU um, have it, like a citizens' initiative, uh, how would that concretely have to take shape? So maybe that's something that we can continue uh, to discuss uh, another, another time. So I think that would be an example next to transparency, where maybe we can, as COSA, collectively try to move forward by having discussions on it and then maybe make concrete proposals. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Appleton. Commissioner Timmermans, everybody was working for you. Now you have five minutes. I'll try and reflect on some of the things that have been said around the table. First of all, if we continue with a practice 
that everything that's bad is Brussels made and everything that's good is homemade, which is the practice in most of our member states, how can you ever increase the democratic legitimacy of the European level? Because if you continue to portray everything that Brussels does as bad, and when something goes well, it's not because of Brussels, but because of us, then no task force can counter that argument in the public's eye. So I believe that uh, part of our responsibility, collective around the table, is to just assume responsibility for decisions taken with our participation, even if those decisions are not the decisions you would have liked. Um, very concretely, um, it was just said around the table that um, it was a scandal that the yellow card on the posting of workers um, uh, amendment had not led to stopping of that amendment. First of all, a yellow card is supposed to say whether the EU has the right to act in that area and whether the instrument used by the EU is the right instrument. That is subsidiarity and proportionality. Amending an existing directive immediately Im eliminates the issue of subsidiarity because there is already EU legislation in that area. So if you don't like the content of a proposal, using the yellow card is arguably not the best way of um, expressing the dislike of the content, but it is the practice of how the yellow card has been used. So this is the first thing we could perhaps reflect upon, how we can get the yellow card, and orange card, red card, whatever you want to call it, to actually be a subsidiarity check and not an instrument to try and influence policies you don't like, which is a different matter. Secondly, um, and by the way, the Direct, the change of the directive posting of workers, it wasn't done by two member states against the will of all the others. It was done by, on the basis of the treaty by majority voting in the European Parliament and in the Council. So at the end of the day, the base of our work is a treaty. And if we do not defend the treaty, and if we do not respect the treaty, if we do not accept that all member states have signed and ratified the treaty, if that's not the starting position of the way we work, then of course it, we go back to power politics in the 19th century tradition, which I believe is not the way forward for Europe, frankly. So, you know, the, the basis of our work should be uh, the treaty. Secondly, um, so a democratic deficit is not just a result of things being not that transparent or far away, etc. It's also a result of the way political rhetoric is being used. Uh, over a long, long period of time. I think it is clear that our citizens are very, very worried about whether we are able to provide sufficient control over their destinies, given the Fourth Industrial Revolution, given everything that's happening in the world. There is a strong feeling in many of our member states, are we still masters of our own destiny? And I think that redefining sovereignty or redefining democratic deficit into the power of stopping things, which is very often in my own country over the past years was very often the, the, the idea that you, you, that you, we need the veto because then we can stop things and then we retain our sovereignty. Sovereignty is not just a power to stop things. Sovereignty is also the power to shape things, to change things. And in that sense, sovereignty only has material importance if it can actually change things for the good. And if you look, and I, 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 I sort of want to try and formulate in my way what, what also President Macron has been formulating, if you look at the challenges we face, climate change, international security, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, migration, the only way we can materialize our sovereignty is by doing it collectively. So just by redefining sovereignty as a nominal thing, you know, a, a man on his own in the desert is sovereign. He also dies of thirst, but he's sovereign. And I, I honestly believe that if we do not take that collective responsibility, that to, um, to reinvigorate European democracy is not just to increase the possibility to stop things, it's also to increase the possibility to act in the interest of the European citizen and to act at the most appropriate level, which is the level closest to the citizen. 
If there is no need to have national policy because you can do it locally, it should be done locally. If there is no need to have European policy because you can do it nationally, it should be done nationally. But there always will be areas where national action is not good enough to give material meaning to our people's sovereignty. And then you will need Europe. And this is the spirit within which the Commission wants to operate in the task force, which is not the end of things. It's just one more stage in the, in the long, long road that we still have to accomplish. And I honestly, you know, I'm sometimes amazed if you hear all the bad things that have been said by Brussels and the Commission, etc., in some of our member states. And then you look into, into public opinion polls, 84% of support for EU membership, 92% of support for EU membership in countries where governments have been bashing the EU and its institutions for years. Then people, we should be optimistic. But you should be optimistic about the, the understanding of our citizens that the EU is their destiny. But they want a better EU, a more transparent EU, a more efficient EU. And it is our collective responsibility to provide that EU to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Timmermans. It is fantastic that we finish on this optimistic note, but we understand that you don't want to resolve an issue which has been there forever, how the collective and the individual can be reconciled, how the individual can become a member of the society and feel appreciated. This is indeed an uphill struggle, and I wish you every success in achieving it. Uh, I didn't know how relative success in politics was before I got involved in politics. It was an honor for me to moderate this discussion. It is an honor for Bulgaria to welcome you all here. and. Uh, Moreover, because Bulgarians always wanted to be part and parcel of this community, even though spiritually we have always been there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vulcev, for helping our communication today. I'd like to thank all the participants and all the keynote speakers for their valuable and valuable contribution in this uh, so important discussion. And perhaps let us finish on a on an optimistic note, a problem can be resolved if we are optimistic and actively wish to do it. So this is the end of this panel, but please remain in your seats uh, a little longer because we still have some more work to do before we can close this meeting. Yesterday, during the meeting of the um, uh, of the uh, mm, chairpersons, we achieved some uh, consensus on the contribution of the 59th COSAC meeting. The um, text has been sent out to you by email. You have it in front of you as well in hard copies. Are there any comments, disagreements with the text? I see none, and thus I assume, we can assume that the conclusions of our meeting have been approved. Congratulations. I did not hear any applause, but uh, it is not needed either. Thank you. Uh, a little prompting was all that it took. There will be applause, however, I hope, for Mr. Buchmann, whom I'm going to invite now to say a few words about the future Austrian presidency. And he, together with Mr. Lopatka, will uh, be taking care of the events uh, within it in the next six months. You have the floor, sir. Yeah, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, I would like to take the opportunity uh, to thank you, uh, Christian Vigenin. Uh, and uh, the Bulgarian friends uh, for organizing and uh, managing our Cossack uh, meeting and especially uh, for the hospitality you offered us. Thanks very much. Uh, I think this is worth an applause. The conclusions and contributions of uh, the 59th Cossack are an excellent basis uh, for the incoming Austrian uh, presidency. 
a Europe uh, that respects uh, is the slogan of uh, the Austrian presidency, as you already know. Our main focus uh, will be on the issues of uh, security and migration, on strengthening competi competitiveness uh, through uh, di digi digitalization and stability uh, in our neighborhood. <coughs> and uh, we are quite aware that uh, we will have to deal with uh, Brexit, uh, for example, with subsidiarity and uh, proportionality issues, as we just discussed these topics, and uh, the multi-annual uh, financial framework. The Austrian delegation is looking uh, forward to welcome uh, the Cossack chairpersons meeting in uh, July in uh, Vienna and also uh, the Cossack meeting uh, in November uh, in uh, Vienna. As uh, you may know, we Austrians uh, like uh, culture, uh, we Austrians uh, like sports. Uh, also, we did not qualify for the, for the football world championships. Uh, and uh, we Austrians uh, like fine culinary and also sweets. And I would like uh, to thank you once again, uh, the Bulgarian friends, and especially uh, Christian Vigenin, for a marvelous job he did uh, during uh, the meeting. And uh, if we say thank you in Austria, we offer some sweets. And uh, that's why I brought on behalf of uh, the Austrian delegation uh, a typical Viennese uh, cake with me. It's uh, the so-called uh, Sachertorte, and I hope you will enjoy it uh, in the leisure time after this meeting. All the best for you. See you in Vienna. Thank you, Mr. Buchmann. We have some, 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 some new surprises, but uh, let's take the, the, the cake first, because I think that's important. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, nice. I'm sure it's also tasty. Thank you, Mr. Buchmann. And I'm sure that uh, in the next six months you will be able to enjoy these kind of cakes also in uh, Austria on different occasions. Uh, uh, now allow me to say a few words uh, at the end of our meeting. I switch uh, to, to Bulgarian. The Tesis 6 message needs Within the last uh, six months, we worked very hard, both within the Bulgarian parliament, in the executive branch, in the government, other institutions. We were ambitious. We wanted to demonstrate we could uh, efficiently chair the EU institutions during the first presidency of Bulgaria. We also wanted to give you a taste of our country, the nature, uh, the culture. I hope we succeeded to a large extent and we can be happy with the outcome. The experience in the last six months demonstrated how important the Cossack format is, how much we can learn from each other, and how important for the EU is our commitment with the national parliament. In order to be even more efficient, we need to be more active in this exchange. One of the conclusions that I made for myself, I'd like to share with you, specifically within the working party meeting from March in Brussels, made me think of the possibility to add yet another in non-formal meeting within this format. It can take place between the uh, Cossack of the presidency and the plenary. Uh, it can be hosted in Brussels by the European Parliament. And we can select a topic we can discuss freely without the time constraints, which are always there, specifically during the plenary. Despite the fact that within one and a half days, only the participants in the discussions may uh, have offered over 120 con contributions. I think this is a record in itself. I am also convinced we have to improve our cooperation with other institutions, not just the European Parliament, the European uh, Economic and Social Committee, the Committee of the Regions. We, work very we worked very actively with them in the last few months, and they attended our meeting yesterday and today. A few words of gratitude to you all for being so active at this meeting. The the colleagues from the trio, Estonia and Austria, uh, for their support, which we did get 
uh, tangibly in the last six months, and to the European Parliament for the support, um, including through the Working Party on subsidiarity and proportionality. The European Parliament did not take uh, immediate part in it, but it supported us in our wish to conduct this debate. I'd like to thank this the Speaker of the Bulgarian Parliament, also the uh, members of uh, the Parliamentary uh, Committee on uh, European Affairs. Without their support, without uh, the, their contribution, the uh, current result simply would not be possible. We want to thank our experts, our assistants, our volunteers specifically, who helped us resolve technical issues in, a, in an expeditious and efficient manner. Technical problems are always part and parcel of uh, such events. I simply can't leave out uh, the executive branch uh, uh, and all institutions. It's my gratitude and the gratitude of the European Commission. You notice that the Prime Minister, the President of the Republic, the uh, Speaker of um, Parliament, two uh, deputy prime ministers, the minister of uh, the uh, European presidency were with us just within this one and a half days. And their support has been uh, staunch throughout the six months of the presidency. So the Bulgarian government and the Bulgarian uh, parliament offered their um, unlimited support. I am certain I'm leaving someone out, but I don't want to leave out the interpreters. They made it possible for us to communicate in the last uh, one and a half days. Uh, thank you for being late to uh, stay longer than uh, scheduled. Uh, thank you. Your work was really excellent and you did help us a lot. So I think you deserve a round of applause. So, I am I'm getting a bit set now, but uh, it's a final element uh, that will be our final surprise. You remember probably our wonderful evening, those of you who attended it on uh, uh, Sunday evening, and you noticed that uh, there were uh, three painters who painted in front of our eyes uh, three paintings. Now I would like to invite uh, our colleagues from Austria, Estonia, the outgoing uh, member of our Troika, and Romania, the an incoming member, because uh, I would like to, to present them with uh, one of those paintings, please. That's our present for you, and I hope you, you, you bring with you and you keep the spirit of uh, our uh, meeting with you in your capitals. Uh, well, I, I would say Estonia because I was uh, so <laughs> I was so thankful for your, for your support during these uh, uh, months. Uh, thank you very much for everything we did together, and we'll continue to count on uh, your help and support in the future. So, this is your painting. Thank, thank you. you. And now Romania expectations are high, so uh, we wish you good luck. Uh, and uh, we had to commit yeah. ourselves to defend NATO. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> and I almost forgot I was a bit, um, you know, yeah, let's make the picture. <laughs> I, 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 I forgot that actually the two excellent, talented guys who uh, actually painted these two pictures, the final two pictures, are here with us. And I, I think you can make a photo with them as well. 
So which is yours? Yeah. This is yeah on the other side. Yeah. And friends, that was the end. Now is the lunch, and uh, the buses will wait outside at uh, half past two. And don't forget anything. If you forget something, we have to keep it here for until the next presidency. <laughs>